That's an important question. It's, it's a, a, a tough question because there are so many components to it. Um, I think the, the, the short answer is that we are already fat adapted as human beings. This is the metabolism that our genes have um, been passing on for thousands of generations. Uh, what has happened in recent times is that we have interfered with that. We have interfered with it by uh, eating refined carbohydrates. And that's the quick, quickest way to reduce your endurance and reduce your fat burning. Um, so um, I, I, I don't like the term fat adaptation. I guess it fits. And I guess because so many people are adapted to carbohydrates that we have to use fat adaptation. But that's what being human is all about. And if we just remove the roadblocks that interfere with fat burning, then we will become fat adapted and maintaining it is relatively easy. And there are two things that will do that. One is a nutritional thing where, uh, like I mentioned, refined carbohydrates will block our ability to burn fat. And if we don't burn as much fat, we store more. And what you're seeing today in the endurance world is a lot of over fat athletes. They're not able to burn fat. They keep storing it. And that's, that's not a, a healthy thing by any means. Um, second, there's a training component. If we build the aerobic system, those slow twitch red muscle fibers are where fat is burned. We burn fat in those aerobic muscle fibers. And that fat is converted to energy, ATP, and it gives us really an unlimited supply of energy. And the muscles, uh, when they have unlimited energy, fatigue much less. They're literally, they're called fatigue resistant muscle fibers because they don't fatigue as long as you keep, um, as long as the muscles keep getting a supply of fat and they can convert it to ATP for energy, we don't fatigue. And you'll see um, athletes who are fat adapted, like Amanda, a couple of weeks ago at the Ironman, uh, coming up to the finish line. She was as happy and, and smiley as can be. And when she crossed uh, the finish line, looked like she could go jog for another 10K. Um, the, the energy is, is always going to be there. It's not a diet. It's the way humans have eaten for millions of years. Uh, the diet is, is the current um, governmental recommendations, which um, sometimes they're, you know they're suggesting that we eat sixty or seventy percent of our diet as refined carbohydrates. That's just criminal to make that recommendation from a clinical standpoint. That boy, that's malpractice. That's that's unethical. Um, I think we have a consensus now um, that uh, the amount of sugar that's in our diet is, is the reason for the overfat epidemic, the obesity epidemic, the diabetes epidemic, the chronic illness that we're seeing escalating, even though we know all, supposedly, we know all about um, health and, and how to stay healthy. It's not working because uh, that one significant factor, refined carbohydrates, is a major part of uh, the world diet. And um, so that is the diet and we need to avoid diets uh, and we should eat intuitively as we feel. And then some people take advantage of it and say, well, I feel like I need to eat a lot of sugar. That's called addiction. Sugar addiction is part of the problem. And um, just like the, the big tobacco industry, the big sugar industry has gotten people addicted and it's tough to get off it, but it can be done. Well, there's a difference between consuming the sports drinks, which is mostly glucose in some form, uh, carbohydrate in some form. Um, there's a difference between consuming those products during a race and consuming those products during the day, during our downtime, when we're having a meal, 
Um, if we have a meal of, uh, of a sugary energy bar and a, and a glass of sugary drink, um, that's very dangerous. But during the event itself, um, some carbohydrate will be needed, but it doesn't mean you have to get it from a sugary sports drink. You can get it from fruit juice, uh, a 6% fruit, uh, fruit juice, um, uh, product is a, is a, a perfect one for an endurance athlete. Um, and I think, um, those are the kind of things you experiment with during training to find out how much you need. The other thing, and, and many people don't realize it, but um, when you become so-called fat adapted, when you're burning more fat for energy, your nutritional needs during the race, your need for carbohydrates during the race goes down dramatically. I'll use uh, Amanda Stevens again. Um, uh, before she started to become better fat adapted, she was consuming about 400 um, calories an hour during the Ironman. As she became more fat adapted, that number went down to 145 calories an hour. And as she became even more fat adapted, it went down to 125 calories an hour, excuse me, 145 calories an hour. And then it went down to 100 and 15 or 20 calories an hour. That's, that is fat burning at its finest. Um, the more fat you burn from your own body during a race, the less additional carbohydrate you're going to need. And with less carbohydrates being pushed into your body, your gut is not going to have any problems. And as everyone knows, gut problems are so common in endurance sports because of what we put into our stomach or what we try to put into our stomach during competition. Not a very easy thing to do. So um, better fat burning will, will reduce your need for calories during the, during the event itself. But I think when we talk about avoiding refined carbohydrates, we're talking about our, our meals that we consume during the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Uh, during the race, we may we we most likely will need some carbohydrates along with fats and proteins to help us get through the race in a in a way that we reach our optimal performance. I think so. Um, I do know the pacing strategy, and I I believe part of the reason it works so well is because the athletes I work with are fat adapted. And that strategy is um, a consistent pace. We have, we have, you know, it's, it's part of our no pain, no gain environment that um, runners, for example, go out much faster at the beginning of a race uh, than they can possibly maintain, even even get close to maintaining. Um, and uh, I remember uh, I worked with ultra marathon Stu Middleman for a number of years. And I would have him begin the race by walking uh, some of the longer races where you're going to be walking anyway. And I, you know, so it, it was almost um, funny. We would, we would be at a race and the first time, uh, the first time I worked with him at a race uh, was in the La Rochelle uh, world championship six day event. And here are all the runners lined up at the starting line and the gun goes off and everybody takes off except for Stu who starts walking. And it was just, it was a, it was a funny sight. Um, people were looking strangely at him. Um, but he ended up, um, in, in his, his first real, uh, big event, uh, finishing second overall, uh, running almost 600 miles in that six day period. So, um, I think if we look at another analogy at the, the breaking the two hour marathon, how can a runner do that? I think the best way a runner could do that is to run at a 434 pace every mile. Don't go out at 420, 
don't run a fast mile in the middle when you're trying to break away from the pack. There's no other runners in the field but you. And so if you can run a 434 pace, you'll break two hours for a marathon. And if somebody else beats you, more power to them. But more than likely, uh, nobody's going to catch you.